1995 Tour de France, which started in the Brittany town of Saint Briere. Well, if Miguel Indurain crosses this finishing line with the best time today, he will again have proved just what a real threat he is in any Tour de France. But last year it was the English rider Chris Boardman who won the prologue time trial, and he'll hope to repeat that feat today here in Saint Briere. He was out very early training on the course along with his GAN teammates, and afterwards we asked him just how he felt about this short time trial going to be quite difficult having seen the course now it's, it's got quite a quite a lump in it uh, and that's that just rather suit other riders but uh, no I just give it a hundred percent and see what happens I think well, physically I'm in good shape um, really I can't account for what the others are going to do so that's their problem and not mine I think I can win it but uh, whether I will or not is another thing probably about 60 percent in my favor I think among the early starters former French champion Jackie Durand set the trend with a time of nine minutes exactly for the 7.3 kilometers. It was a good time, but the stars of the race, all later to start, were expected to better that. Then, from the west, the skies darkened, and after only an hour of competition, the sunny and warm day changed its face to that of a demon. The light rain turned into a deluge. By the time Boardman started at 9.24, conditions were the worst possible, and no rider had approached the early time of Durand. Boardman launched himself from the start house, still intent on being the champion of the day. But after only four minutes of racing and with the best time thus far, the prologue favourite lost control on the slippery surface and was lucky to survive this horrendous crash. His team car, taking avoiding action, stopped inches from him. Boardman remounted and tried to go on, but it was all in vain. His injury such that Boardman's tour was already over and the hospital was his next overnight stop. It was here where doctors confirmed his exit from the tour. During the race, he, uh, Chris uh, fall, and uh, on this uh, tibia, the two bones of the ankle, there is a, a broken, the two bones, and there is a problem of stability of the joint. It's necessary to block this joint. The rain continued throughout the prologue and the big names came and went, but they couldn't reach the time set by Durand, who had never won a time trial in his career. After a long wait while the farce was enacted, Jackie Durand was confirmed as the first yellow jersey of the Tour 95. Next morning, from his hospital bed in saint brieuc Chris Boardman could only reflect on his darkest hour as a bike rider. The prologue was the first goal, it wasn't the most important. Um, it was something, a, a little bit of insurance. It was something I could do. I could take the yellow jersey in the Tour de France, so I really wanted to try and do that. One minute I was going at 80k an hour, and the next minute I wasn't. <laughs> um, I'm not so sure it was me pushing too hard, actually. That was my first thought. It's more the change in surface, and with the dimming light, it was very difficult to see the uh, where it was totally smooth tarmac and where it was grippy, and when you're pushing it to the limit. So Britain had lost its only hope of winning the Tour de France. Chris Boardman was out, and the new surprise leader was Jackie Durand. He'd won the prologue time trial with a time just outside of nine minutes. Then to the end of the first stage, and Fabio Baldato, the new sprinter on the block, was showing just what a strong finisher he is when it's slightly uphill. Baldato digging deep, while Laurent Jalabert slipped into second place, and Jamaluddin Abdou Japarov was third. Jackie Durand was safely in the field. He kept his lead.
So Baldato had an early stage win in the Tour de France, finishing ahead of almost the whole field. Tony Rominger, notably, was sixth. And the overall situation, Jackie Giron kept his two-second advantage over Laurent Brochard. The French had started well, three men in the top three places. The race continued its journey along the coastline of Western France, but not for this man, the new champion of France, Eddie Seigneur, out with an injured knee. The battle out on the open road was between the world's best finishers, Abdou Japaroff on the right in the centre, Cipollini and Laurent Jalabert. They were contesting the points for the green jersey competition. And when it came down to the big finish at Vitre, Cipollini was showing us just what a great finisher he is. Watch out for the Lion King as he bursts out the field. Cipollini is a man already winning 15 races this year. This was to be win number 16. And all the sprinters were there, and they were all being beaten by the fastest finisher in the world. Cipollini coming clear. The rider on the far right of our picture is the new sprinter Giovanni Lombardi. Abdou Japaroff again was in the top three, while Baldato this time only finished fourth. Mario Cipollini, the self-proclaimed fastest man in the world. There are few who can dispute it when he's as good as this. But there was a new leader. Jackie Duran had gone now, and the leader on the small time bonuses gained out on the open road was Laurent Jalabert. He now had an advantage of five seconds over Brochard. Then came the stage three time trial. This the first big test for the leaders, supposedly, of this year's Tour de France. The time always taken on the fifth man, the 21 teams of nine riders, gave their best for their team leaders. And there was no team better than Gay Wispelan. They led at every checkpoint, and they were coming to the finish with nearly all of their team together. 22.3 kilometres, they were the best time in 24 minutes and 48 seconds. At 42 kilometres, that time was 45 minutes and 16 seconds. They were always ahead of the second place team on the road, Onse. Notably, two already finished by the time Gavis arrived was the Benesto squad, and they had put themselves into the frame as well. Miguel Ingerain was here to fight for a fifth Tour de France. The arrival of the Gay Wiz team, and it was the fastest time. Not surprisingly, because of those time checks out on the course. Evgeny Berzin, the winner of last year's Tour of Italy, was leading them home. This meant the Gay Wiz were here to challenge Big Mig, and so too were the team of Laurent Jalabert, Anse. The Anse team have always been that musketeer-type team. We race for one, and one races for all. Jalabert now was their man in the yellow jersey, and they were going to keep him there as long as possible. Alex Zula on the back on the far right, he was the man perhaps they were thinking of as a long-term candidate for Big Mig's yellow jersey, but right now they were thinking only of Laurent. It was a great ride by Anse, they weren't as fast indeed as Gavis, but they were quicker than Bonesto. So even Alex Zula, who'd moved up to sixth overall, had gained something out of this great team time trial. Their time was 1 hour, 13 minutes and 45 seconds. 35 seconds slower, in fact, than Gaywis. Laurent Jalabert had retained his yellow jersey, in fact, by 8 seconds over Ivan Gotti, who was the best placed of the Gaywis team after the prologue time trial. Then it was back onto the open road, the race now heading towards Le Havre, on the other northern coastline of France. This was being a tour of accidents, though. Hendrik Redant was out, and so too was this rider from Mercatoni Uno. But this was the big crash of the day. Just a couple of kilometres from the finish, Sammy Morels of the Lotto team led the whole field into the barriers. And the man delayed with a broken bicycle was the yellow jersey of Laurent Jalabert. Surprisingly, no Anse rider had seen him fall. He was left to wallow at the back of the race. He was going to lose time. He was going to lose his yellow jersey. In the big sprint for the line, though, it was Cipollini again who was going to burst out of the pack and take victory. This time ahead of the new German sprinter on the left from Telecom, Eric Zabel. He's still got to learn about how the master does it, though. Laurent Jalabert finished 148th and lost 50 seconds, and, of course, his yellow jersey went as well. But there were other men delayed by that crash, too, and more seriously injured they were. Fabio Baldato, the winner of Stage 1, came home with 12 stitches in his face. He would start next day, he wouldn't finish. Ivan Gotti was now the new leader. Here's a man who often gets up towards the leadership of a big race, but never takes over yellow. And his face seemed to give us one of, what am I doing here? So Gotti was now the leader of this race by just a single second from Bjorn Arisi's teammate as the race headed now to Dunkirk, the longest stage of 261 kilometres. Injurain was always conscious of keeping out of trouble, riding near the front while at the back and returning to the peloton after a puncture, Jackie Duron was now finding the downs as well as the ups of this year's Tour de France. 
Giron crashing as he almost rejoined the field. Then the big sprint at Dunkirk, and again the sprinters were having a field day, but this time they were all to get a shock. If everything had gone to form, it should have been a third stage win for Mario Cipollini, but this was a very difficult sprint to judge. It was a long, straight and wide road, and the man who knew just how to ride it was the TVM rider from Holland, Lavens. Jerome Lavens in the red, white and blue saw the finish and kicked for it. The sprinters weren't marking him. They'd never heard of him before. They couldn't take his wheel. He got the stage win ahead of Jan Zarada and Eric Zabel. Cipollini only finished in fifth place. Zabel was the man who was really annoyed. And this was the happiest man. He was destined not to finish the tour, but he had taken the first stage win of his career in it. It was part of the plan to go home afterwards. Ivan Gotti had retained his one-second advantage over his teammate Bjorn Arise. Melchior Mari of Onse was in third place, 17 seconds back. Now the race faced up to three stage finishes in Belgium, and when they crossed over the border from France, the race was in no hurry to meet its rendezvous at Charleroi, a ride of 202 kilometres. It was a slightly uphill finish in Charleroi. It should have been a day for the sprinters again, but it was to have a very surprise result on the overall situation. This was the 25th birthday of the telecom rider Eric Zabel. He'd already said he wanted to win the stage in Belgium on his birthday. He'd now been beaten already on stage finishes, so everybody knew he was a fast finisher. But even the German television team thought this wasn't the finish for him. A very difficult approach, then uphill. But indeed, he found the team all willing to help him. Olaf Ludwig was leading out, Jan Verada was right on his wheel, so too was Giovanni Lombardi in yellow. And then on the far right of the picture, Eric Zabel made his move. This was a very inspired finish indeed. It was a case of saying, happy birthday, Eric. He takes it right on the line. But although it looked like a bunch sprint, in fact, the judges had split the bunch into three. And therefore, Ivan Gotti, who was in the third section, had lost time. As a result, the new leader was Bjarne Ries. I've been too close, you know, and today I have it. And I'm very satisfied with that. Well, Gotti, uh, he lost it. I'm sorry for him, but it's the way the race is. It's the way the Tour de France is indeed, and the race continued on the road from Charleroi to Liège. He was covering much of the circuit used in the famous liege bastogne liege Classic. And the rider now in the hot seat by just two seconds was Bjarne Arise. The Gaywis team are having a great tour, but they weren't ready for this, because towards the end of the stage into Charleroi, Miguel Indurain himself was in angry mood. Johan Brunel joined him and then said, I can't work with you, it's not in the policy of the Onse team. So he decided to follow Miguel Indurain. Well, for many years now, Miguel Indurain has won the Tour de France, but you rarely get the sight of this, a man on the attack. And he wasn't looking for the yellow jersey now, he was simply out to punish his rivals. Miguel Indurain surprised last year on the climb of Otakam. He was now doing it in the streets of Liège. Over the last few kilometres, Johan Brunel, the hold of the fastest stage ever in a Tour de France, which he did a couple of years ago to Amiens, was content to follow. It was a special day for him. He was coming home to the Ardennes city. He knew the King of Belgium was waiting. He was now going to give him not just a stage winner from Belgium, but also a new wearer of the yellow jersey. This was a great day for Johan Brunel, but it was even a greater day for Miguel Indurain. He had literally destroyed his rivals. They saw him go. They couldn't reach him. And Miguel Indurain was extremely annoyed when he finished because he was annoyed at the fact that Brunel had not allowed him to win the stage. The crowd cheered him all the way up to the line. Brunel waited and waited all of the time, looking over Miguel Indurain's shoulder to see where that finishing line was. And when it came into sight, he then started to make his move. Indurain even so had plenty of fight here. He was determined to finish this off with a big win. After all, he's never won a road race stage of a Tour de France since he started winning the event back in 1991. But you can't beat a Belgium inspired, and Johan Brunel won the stage and took the overall lead. The face of Big Mig in full cry. We saw it in the clouds of Otakam in the Pyrenees a year ago. Now we were seeing it in the sunshine of Liège. Johan, two quick questions. Could you have dreamed this morning that you were going to put on the yellow jersey tonight? No, I never thought about it. Uh, um, we had uh, to attack at the, in the final and I attacked on the Montu. But I never thought about it. It was only to try to eliminate, eliminate some uh, sprinters for Jalabert. And, uh, I was surprised to see in the Rhine and from that moment I, I took his wheel and he, he, he took me to the finish.
And just 15 kilometers to go, you actually came up alongside Indra and you, you pushed him. What did you say to him there? Uh, he, try, he asked me to, to ride with him and I told him uh, I could not. The, the team tactic was like that. And apart from finishing in front of King Albert, he finished in front of the other king, King Eddie Merckx, five-time winner of the Tour de France for Belgium. So after stage seven, Johan Brunier was in yellow, 31 seconds ahead of Miguel Indurain. That man was there again. Laurent Jalabert worked his way back up to third. Of the other top men, Berzin was only eighth, and Tony Rominger was over two minutes back in 12th place. So to the time trial. The man himself, always in charge of the time trial, was about to have a shock. Miguel Indurain wasn't starting last, of course. He was starting three minutes in front of Johan Brunil. And after his brilliant ride to the Belgian Ardennes, the time trial now between Huy and Sarang was being held in sweltering conditions. And the challenge was again coming from Bjarne Rees, who was now out of his leader's yellow jersey and in to his new champion of Denmark's jersey. Rees was setting the fastest time at the late checks. Nobody could believe this. After all, Bjarne Rees was not known as a top time trial rider. Laurent Jalabert was also continuing his marvellous tour, as indeed he had continued a marvellous season. Gone now were the memories which caused him to crash on the very first day in Armentier a year ago. Here, another intermediate check. Indurain had gone through just 15 seconds better than Rees. Now it's beginning to look as though Rees was no longer a flash in the pan. At 13 kilometres, Rees was 31 seconds down. At 22 kilometres, Rees was up into second place, 25 seconds behind Indurain. He was now just 15 seconds behind Indurain, and the hardest part of the course was still to come. The arrival of Tony Rominger and the best time for the moment at least going ahead of Bruno Tibu. One hour, five minutes and 14 seconds. Rominger was well in front, but the shocks were still out on the course and the biggest shock of them all was Bjarne Rees. Rees was absolutely flying. Here was a man ultra inspired. He was going past big names like Melchior Maury at one time third overall in this year's Tour de France. He'd now been caught and was about to be dropped. Bjarne Rees was riding so well, he was inspiring almost 75% of Denmark to watch this race on television. The viewing figures were astronomical. So, Rees was in a mood now, and he didn't know it because his team car wasn't telling him. But the tyres were indicating he was going quicker than Miguel Indurain. Evgeny Berzin, yet to show himself, had to do so this day. His time was good, but it wasn't great. One hour, five minutes, 51 seconds and counting. As Berzin came to the line, he slipped behind Tony Rominger. Meanwhile, out on the road, the shock was there for all to see. Bjarne Rees was now going through the fourth time check, 58 minutes and 49 seconds. Indurain was yet to arrive here. But there was now speculation that Bjarne Rees was going quicker than the great Mig himself. Melchior Maury refused to let go from his sight, the sight of the Danish champion, but even so, he was sitting just far enough behind to avoid being penalised for pacing. The arrival of Alex Zula, another Swiss man who once set the Tour de France alight in his first year, when on his birthday he took the leader's yellow jersey. Then, as planned, he retired from the race. Alex Zula was losing time, big time indeed. This long climb to the finish is proving to be quite a headache for most finishers. And then, looking down the road, Bjarne Rees was coming towards the line. By now they knew he'd gone through the check five seconds quicker than in Jurain. And so now Rees, could he hang on on the climb and cause the biggest upset the Tour de France has known for five years? In fact, Bjarne Rees didn't know he was going quicker than Miguel in Jurain, and on the climb to the finish, he too was seen to slow down. Rees was now fighting to maintain a tremendous rhythm, but even so, the clock was indicating he was well ahead of Tony Rominger's time, which was in the finish house at one hour, five minutes and 14 seconds. Rees was now confirming that if he could control this sort of form in the mountains, which would start the day after the rest day, then he was going to be in really a commanding position. Miguel Indurain had a new challenger to his five-time title. Dancing the way up the line in front was Ivan Gotti. Behind was Melchior Maury. Maury would actually finish the time trial in fifth place overall. Rominger was also going to finish now only in third. The rider who was to take the lead was sprinting to the line. Bjorn Rees, his time, one hour, four minutes and 28 seconds. There was only one man left on the course now. Everybody was discounting the yellow jersey of Johan Brunil. The man, of course, is Miguel Indurain. Now, all Bjarne Rees could do was take a shower and wait for his arrival. 
he may know by this point that he had been five seconds ahead with just a couple of kilometers to go. What he didn't know, though, was that this man was digging so deep into his reserves. Miguel Indrain is a very proud man. He wasn't about to lose this time trial either, but it was close. In Durain, his sprint was needed because he took victory by a scant 12 seconds. So, not surprisingly, Miguel Indurain was now the leader of the Tour de France. Reese was second, 23 seconds back. That was the most incredible time trial I think you've ever ridden in your life. Did you know that you were doing that compared with Indurain? No, I didn't know that. If I knew that, maybe I'd have done some more. But... Well, I did what I could. Huh? Be surprised to be your teammate Eugenie Berzin because this morning people said Rominger, Berzin, Indurain were going to be the top three. Nobody mentioned your name. I know that, but I knew it myself. So no surprises to see Miguel Indurain in yellow after a time trial, but a big surprise to see the time gap so small to Bjorn Aris, just 23 seconds. Evgeny Berzin is up in the third place, Johan Brunil fourth, and Rominger is fifth. So, the surprises were there too. Looking down the overall situation in the points competition, Laurent Jalabert was on course, but only nine points ahead of Jamaluddin Abdu Japarov. While in the King of the Mountains, now with the real mountains to come, Richard Varenk, last year's winner, was there again. Now the mountains awaited. And behind me, the slopes of La Plagne. They've only been used twice before in the Tour de France, but they've always given us a dramatic finish. But well, before we join the action on the Col de Saisy, here's Paul Sherwin now to tell us more about the man who has dared to challenge Miguel Indurain. At 31 years of age, Bjorn Rees is the same age as Miguel Indurain. Rees was born in Herning, Denmark, but now resides in Luxembourg. A professional for 10 years, it was not until the 1988 Tour de l'Avenir that he was noticed by Laurent Fignon who immediately brought him into the System U team, where he became Fignon's right-hand man. Fignon claimed that although Rees worked selflessly for him in the Tour de France, he lacked confidence in himself. That all changed in 1993 when Rees stayed with the big stars of the Tour de France in the mountains and reached Paris in fifth place in the overall standings. Last year, he would have made another top 10 place if he hadn't been taken ill on the stage over the Mont Ventoux, slumping to 14th place in Paris. Rees wore the yellow jersey with pride in this year's event, but the superb time trial performance on Sunday confirmed that he'll be a man to watch. The next two days in the Alps will determine whether or not he can be a serious challenger to Miguel Indurain's supremacy. And so now to stage number nine, Le Grand Bournon to La Plagne, 100 miles or 160 kilometres, 169 riders left from the 189 who started. And this has been a remarkable day's racing in many ways, but the main field has fought to keep together here, not surprisingly after a transfer of some 800 kilometres. The riders know they're not in any hurry to face the area of the Alps, where indeed the Olympic Games were held in the winter, not far away nearby Albertville in 1992. The man has been on the attack virtually throughout the day, Alex Zula of Onsay, and it goes to show us once again that the Onsay team are here to take on Miguel Indurain this year. They've already surprised us with the man, Johan Brunil, winning in the age, but now Alex Zula. The hammer will fall down on him. He must show the team he's got the strength. Berzin is in all sorts of trouble here. He's got himself a teammate who's looking after him in the form of Bruno Kengi Alta, but Berzin is not happy at all. And the rider destroying the field today and taking lunch at the moment is Alex Zula. Zula broke clear first of all with a small group. Now he's gone clear on his own as he comes up towards the top of the Corme de Rosalund. This brings him up to 5,413 feet after a climb of 19.7 kilometers, just about 12 miles. And his lead over the field is around about five minutes. So Alex Zula, the star of a couple of years ago, said he would come back to rendezvous with the Tour de France. He's now back now, second in the Tour of Switzerland. This is Bruno Hamburger, the gap, four minutes, 53 seconds to Hamburger. And the chase group behind is about to pick up young Bo because, in fact, Hamburger was with Alex Zula and Federico Munoz. Munoz already back in this group. Hamburger now with them. So Indurain now quite concerned about the attack of Alex Zula. Here is Bo Hamburger starting his descent now of the Corme de Rosaland and still the climb of La Plagne ahead of him. La Plagne, 17.4 kilometres of climbing at an average gradient of 1 in 13 or 7.3%. Now back on the Corme de Roseland, this is Berzin, and Berzin is in all sorts of trouble now. He's losing a lot of ground, 6 minutes 46 seconds. Berzin is not going to feature in this Tour de France. Alex Zula still has 4 minutes 25 seconds, and Pavel Tonkov 
The rider who beat Zula in the Tour of Switzerland is now chasing him alone. Well, Tonkov rode so well in the Tour of Switzerland, he chose a mountain stage to take the lead away from Zula when Zula seemed set to win his home tour for the first time. And I don't think Zula will forgive Tonkov for that, but now Tonkov trying to get back on terms, and nobody prepared to help Miguel Indurain. He knows while he wears yellow, and such a dominant, per dominant personality, he's really got to do it all himself, and he's doing it all himself. This is Indurain now coming up to the rear wheel of Pavel Tonkov, and I'm absolutely amazed, but nobody has been able to go with Miguel Indurain, and just like on the road into Liège, Indurain has used his strength to go away from the field. What an unbelievable piece of cycling by this man. Well, all of those people who used to criticise Miguel Indurain for playing in the time trials and watching in the mountains, these past two years, you can't say he does that now. Marco Pantani, the first time he showed any form in this year's Tour. Remember, he missed the Giro d'Italia because of that accident just before the Tour started in Italy. Now, he's in the mountains here in France. We remember him so well from last year. Now, he's trying to climb back up alongside Miguel Indurain. Indurain has caught Tonkov. These are the lower slopes of La Plaine. Well, Indurain looking for no help as Tonkov now takes his wheel and he must wonder what he started because Indurain riding so well, the gap is coming down. Four minutes and three seconds now, Indurain behind Alex Zula. But again, we're seeing just what a great man Indurain is. When it comes down and the chips are on the floor, he picks them up and he really can put things to rights himself. And he's got rid of Tonkov. Tonkov on the lower slopes of La Plagne. We go way over the ride to our right there, to the top of this climb. And Indurain knows he must go early. He must keep a fast rhythm because he's going to have to reduce this advantage of Alex Zula, which is now quite enormous. So the man in yellow now having to go in search of the leader by himself. And I couldn't quite see what the time gap was on the blackboard or the green board as it is these days in the Tour de France. But I think it'll be reasonably good news for Indurain. There's no sign of anybody else. Rominger here sitting at the tail of this group. And this isn't the Tony Rominger which scalped everybody in the Tour of Italy. But you have to remember that Miguel Indurain was not in the Tour of Italy, the two-time winner of that race. Just look at the rhythm of this man. His face telling us, though, that he is fully committed here. That he's reaching his limits because he wants the time back. He hurts himself. Then what does he do to his rivals? Well, he's now in full flight chasing Azula. A quick recap of the day on the Col du Marais. It was Varenk who went over the top of that small fourth category climb first. Varenk again on top of the third category climb of the Col de Lepine. And then the breakaway started to move clear on the Cote de L.A. And finally, on the Col de Saisy, it was Munoz, Zula and Hamburger chasing them by seven seconds. This is Paolo Lanfranchi here, who's trying to get in on the picture. He was a rider who rode his first Tour de France last year and abandoned it on stage 12. Well, we haven't quite got to that stage just yet. And he's riding a very steady climb up the mountain indeed. And there's still five kilometres or three miles to the summit. And this group is round about six minutes still behind Alex Zula. Indurain is some four minutes in front of them. This is Ivan Gotti sitting behind Marco Pantani. They're a little bit closer. And now you can see Pantani. He's not quite got the form yet that we saw last year. And all of the cheers now coming from the Onse team car here because they're beginning to upset Miguel Indurain this year. First of all, Brunil stole the march over him in Belgium. And now the Swiss star Alex Zula is attacking the team here. And you know, that's what this race could come down to be this year, a battle of the Onse team against the Bernesto team. And is the Bernesto team as strong as their leader? Only time will tell. And this is the chase group, Lord Alina Cabinho on the right there. He won a stage in the Tour of Italy. He's got two stages in that great race over the years now. And also riding very solidly here is Claudio Chiapucci at the back and on our left. And number 51 is Richard Berenk, the leader in the King of the Mountains. He's had quite a good day today. He's been scoring very regularly on the big climbs, the first ones of the Tour this year. But now under the three kilometre to go banner for Alex Zula and he's lost none of his rhythm at all. He certainly lost a little bit of time though to Indurain. Indurain is pulling this back into a much more realistic time game by Alex Zula. But what a great escape by this young man. This has been a marvellous stage in today. He went clear on his own after he'd gone over the top of the Col de Saisy. He was over the top of the Corme de Roselon by himself by almost five minutes. With Indurain now trying to save the day and riding so strongly. 
And here on the front left is Tony Rominger losing another big bunch of time here to the two men he should be really very, very worried about, Zula and Injure, not to mention, of course, Pantani is also up the road. And it's uh, Escartin, his teammate, who's trying to keep the pace up. Varenk looks across at Rominger. They're all looking at each other here now. Varenk thinking of a high finish for the King of the Mountains at the top of La Plana. And this is La Plana now. And the arrival of Alex Zula. The time gap is steadying at 2 minutes 40 seconds. Azula now tries to put in a nice sprint for the finish here. And here is the chase by Miguel Indurain himself. What a marvellous stylist this man is. He just sits there and concentrates totally. He's pushed himself once again to the limit here in defence of his yellow jersey. There's one way to annoy Miguel Indurain and that's to attack him. And looking further down the group here, this is Ivan Gotti in second place as Pantani now tries to take on Gotti. Gotti turning out to be something of a revelation of this year's Tour de France in his first race. Three kilometres to go for Indurain, two kilometres to go for Alex Zula. The difference, well, we don't have to be mathematicians, is just over half a mile now between the two on the road. Well, at least Indurain is not going to be given an easy road to Paris this year. The Anse team are anxious to take him on, so too are the Gavis team. Once more, the Anse team riding their pink Tour de France jersey. Their normal colours, of course, are yellow. For obvious reasons, as we look at Miguel, that is why they don't ride in yellow jerseys in the Tour. The pink jerseys of Anse now, and behind the yellow jersey of Miguel Indurain. This is a great pursuit. He's still gaining time, you know, but he's now knocking off seconds rather than big chunks of time. They've levelled dramatically in this last two kilometres. Indurain knows now though that he's riding away from the rest of the field. Pavel Tonkov, he's dropped, is now more than two minutes behind him. And he's done all that damage in about six kilometres of climbing here on La Plagne. Still holding his rhythm. One kilometre to go for Alex Zula. No doubt now that this man is going to take his first ever stage win in a Tour de France. It's been a while in coming, but it's going to be a memorable one because he's taken it so well. He's ridden the last half of the stage on his own. And there's no finer way than to win a stage when you conquer the mountains by yourself. Alex Zula. Well, he was thinking of big time gains now. Well, I think right now he's just thinking of finishing first across the line. I don't know how much he knows about the chase of injury. And you certainly know he's coming on his own because um, Saez will have told him, the team manager. As we see now... Indurain still squeezing out every second time he can claw back from this rider. Zula, how much is he taking out of himself here now as he gets ready for the finish? Because tomorrow we have that hard day on the road to Alp Duez. And after a tough day today, it will hurt. Alex Zula then comes up towards the line. He's going to win the stage for Onse. Onse get another stage win in the bag. What a great race they are having. But this one will give Zula now at least second place overall in the Tour de France. I think I'm safe in saying he won't get in Durain's jersey now. Four hours, 41 minutes and counting as he crosses the line. This is now the chase. Alex Zula, who started the day a fair way behind, but now he's closed the gap dramatically. He was four minutes and 29 seconds behind this morning. He's now going to be around about two and a half minutes behind in Durain at the finish. The man has taken time back on Big Mig, and that surely is going to give him confidence now as this race unfolds, not just here in the Alps, but also in the Pyrenees. In Durain, the clock counting on the left of the screen, is coming up towards the line. He's going to be just on two minutes, the time loss, and at one stage, remember, it was nearer five minutes. So this has been a superb performance, yet another one by Miguel In Durain. My goodness me, he gets so annoyed when he thinks his yellow jersey is in danger. And it's just going to be slightly over two minutes. It's a long way up La Plana towards the finish. These barriers go on for quite a while. And Interrain is now getting the feel of them all. 25 metres to go. He sprinted out just over two minutes. Two minutes, two seconds. And now Pavel Tonkov is coming up, but he's a lot further back than that, as you can see. His time gap has gone out now to over four minutes, but he's going to hang on to his finest finish in a stage of the Tour de France. Last time I saw this man in action, he was winning a stage in the rain in Great Britain in the milk race. That was when he was an amateur rider riding for Russia. And now the balding Marco Pantani, he comes over too, fourth ahead of Ivan Gotti. The sprint now for fifth place, Richard Varenk gets the points for the King of the Mountains, ahead of Tony Rominger, Lanfranchi and Chiapucci in that order. Laurent Jalabert, not too bad a day for him in the mountains because he's not yet made his mind up whether he's going for the yellow or the green. He certainly wants the green jersey. 
Bjorn Arish crosses the line. But this is the man who has the day taped up. A great win for Alex Zula. And he wins the stage by two minutes and two seconds. Overall, then, Indurain keeps yellow. 2.27 ahead of Zula. Bjorn Arish is still there in third place, but now almost six minutes back. Rominger continues to lose time. And the first day in the Alps, 16 riders eliminated or abandoned, including the sprinter Mario Cipollini. And by the way, the race referees hadn't realised he'd given up and did place him on the stage. So they were a little bit embarrassed this morning when he said he'd retired halfway through it yesterday. Now the riders heading away from the town of Aim, La Plagne, heading towards Alpe d'Huez, their next big rendezvous on this, the jagged peaks of probably the finest mountain in France, certainly the most famous, and it's been made famous by the Tour de France ever since Fausto Coppi first climbed in 1952. This is now the climb of the Col de la Croix de Fer, the overall distance just over 100 miles, and this is a brute of a climb, it's always very difficult, not too many spectators can get down the narrow roads and park up on it, otherwise the race will would be simply blocked. So consequently, most of the spectators here have had to walk down its slopes from the summit. And after the escapades of Alex Zula yesterday, this is now Alvaro Mekir of Motorola, and the chase group here, containing the race leader, Miguel Indurain, is approximately one and a half minutes behind. So Indurain is gambling at the moment that all of the damage can be repaired once they descend the Croix de Fer and head down the valley road to Bourg Guazon and then start the climb of Alpe d'Huez itself. Claudio Chiapucci on the right of our picture here. The tempo set by the Benesto team. Gerard Rue is the rider in second place here. The faithful lieutenant of Miguel Indurain puts in so much work on his behalf. There is now Alex Zula taking up his place in second position behind the yellow jersey, as he is indeed overall. Tony Rominger sitting at the back with Arsenio Gonzalez, but at least he's with this group here. Low again, not looking too good as Richard Varenk now starts to spin for the top. Varenk is in the breakaway move here, has been for a little while now. And there's good points at stake and Varenk makes them look very, very easily as he goes over the top. And Munoz takes second place there. Johan Brunil wasn't too far behind either. Time gap starting to count on the left of our screen and it's a minute and 20 seconds as now Miguel Indurain's group starts to approach the summit. So the gap hasn't uh, closed at all on the climb of the Col de la Croix de Fer, but Indurain still has a number of teammates there and this is quite a select little group here. They start to go over the top, that's where we are, we're just beginning the descent now of the Croix de Fer, so that's quite a tough climb behind the riders. And Marco Pantani now dreaming of catching the breakaway, perhaps he's in the chase group originally. Now he's just ahead of the group containing Miguel Indurain as they start the slopes of the climb of Alpe d'Huez. And this is amazing, but Pantani went immediately, the hill began here of Alpe d'Huez, and the breakaway also started to collapse. And now Ivan Gotti is the rider who's gone forward of the group. So again, Gotti is surprising, and here he is, and he's pacing up Richard Varenk at the moment. But Marco Pantani is already beginning to eat into the tail markers of this original breakaway of some 13 men. And there he is. So Pantani, he tried a little bit yesterday. He didn't do what he wanted to do. He said his form wasn't quite there. Well, he has the reserves to go on, and it looks as though his form is coming day by day. He's now on the climb of Alpe d'Huez, and he wants a performance. Lange Jalabert just ahead in the green jersey. Jalabert, one of the early escapers today, alongside Richard Varenk. Jalabert still unsure whether he's going for the yellow jersey competition because he's scoring points in the mountains, and it's a long time since a man in charge of the points jersey has been able to do that. Certainly not Jamaluddin Abdu Japarov. But Pantani is flying up the slopes of Alpe d'Huez here, and a marvellous, marvellous crowd yet again. Very hot day, but Gotti is the rider who's trying to go for gold on his own. The lone man in the front, and just look at Pantani, the pure climber, as he goes past the king of the mountains, Richard Varenk, who isn't a pure climber. He struggles a lot on the climbs, but he finishes up with the best sprint at the top of them and grabs the points, that's what matters. And now he's trying to hold on to the wheel of Pantani. Well, I'm not sure he'll be able to do that. The rider falling back is Fernando Escartin. And Jalabert, the cheek of Lange Jalabert, too. Winner of Milan San Remo this year, the start of what has been a fantastic season for him. And Jalabert's face never tells you anything. Antani now, he lifted his pace. He didn't get rid of them. They settled in nicely behind him. Even Escartin here with his hunched shoulders hooked up to the back as well. These are the four riders now chasing Ivan Gotti. 
So Gay Wiz using Gotti once more. This is a man who has finished in the top 10 in the Dauphiné Libre stage race. In other small stage races, he's finished in the top five, but he's never won a big one. And uh, as you know now, he wore the yellow jersey in this year's Tour de France, lost it to a teammate when unusually so, the referees spit that punch in the sprint finish. They say, by the way, if they can see a complete barrier between the riders in the group, then they always give that split a separate time. Uh, well, I don't know if they mentioned, but they made the barriers a bit wider this year. Pantani now coming through towards the halfway mark on the climb of Alp Duez, and he's now picked up Ivan Gotti. Now, what's Gotti going to do about this when he sees the man they've nicknamed Dumbo the Elephant come flying by? It's rather a miserable insult, I think, on the fact that his ears stick out. But even so, this man is a character and very, very welcome on the Tour de France. He's a marvellous climber too, and he's just accelerated again. A little acceleration just to see if he can shake Gotti. If he can't, he'll sit down, ease back on the pedals, let Gotti think he's safe, and he might well kick again. He's Rue still setting the pace on the climb for Miguel Indurain. And Big Mig looking rather content with the way things are going. He knows the breakaway is completely disintegrated. Now he's got to set about bringing them back one by one. And this is Bjorn Arise here, who's turning out to be quite a sensation in this year's Tour de France. And the rider with him is Laurent Madwas. So Bjorn Arise climbing the mountain. And uh, the rider in the Castorama team is going to have a lot of men looking out to sign him next year on the teams because he is riding better and better. So Madwas has come up with Bjorn Aris. They've picked up Laurent Jalabert, Richard Varenk and Escartine. So Indurain's group then is still behind Bjorn Aris and somehow Aris has slipped these. Now Indurain might do well to note that because he has lost, uh, almost lost time in the time trial. He has also found himself on the defensive in the mountains. He's not going to let things happen like this for too long. Here's Indurain now, starting to step up the tempo. Alex Zula's got his wheel. I wonder how Zula is feeling after that marvellous ride he put in yesterday. Indurain again left without a Bernesto man around him at this crucial stage of the race. They get him to where they want to put him, but then they can't go with him. And now Indurain has continued on his own. Zula has hooked up to the back end of him and he's going to stay with him, I think. So number one, the winner of the Tour de France the past four years, is now having to do the work again himself. His biggest danger man, and there he is, Bjorn Arise is in front. A little bit of message from the back, and in fact in the car there is Evgeny Berzin. So Berzin, who was in trouble on the Quad de Fer, has abandoned the Tour de France. He has never been happy. Well, that's settled one thing now. The leader of the Gay Wiz team is this man here, Bjorn Aris. And Marco Pantani is the leader of the Carrera team. And Pantani going it alone. So Pantani has decided to fly. He's left the group. Indurain is trying desperately to come up. And here he is, a minute 30 behind Pantani. Now he's going to feel very happy with this. He won't see Pantani as the main contender for the overall victory in Paris. And he's got Alex Zula well under control at the moment. What a superb pursuit this is. We're now through the village of Uez, which is about three miles from the summit of Alp Duez. And there's the Spanish flags flying. And the man they're going to see, Miguel Indurain, is the rider that they are really most interested in seeing. And here he is now, the group behind. Well, the group in front, rather, is now being picked up by Miguel Indurain and the heart's going to hit the bottom of the boot when they see him come along. I don't think they're going to see this rider now before the finishing line. He's not climbing just like he was a year ago, but then how could he be, having had that incident with a car which knocked him off and hurt his knee, stopped him riding the Tour of Italy, and now he's trying to make amends in the Tour de France. Sorry about the little bit of picture interference we're experiencing here as we get up towards the summit of Alp Duez, but here's the man probably causing most of the pain and interference, and that's Miguel Indurain. You see, he's gone immediately to the front of this group. He knows his place as leader of the Tour de France, that's for sure. A little placard on the right there for Bruno Thibault, who's having a great uh, Tour de France this year. So too is this rider, Laurent Madras. He's now trying to be best of the rest here. But Laurent isn't quite the climber of Marco Pantani, I don't think. Miguel Indurain, Alex Zula, Reese has now picked up the wheel of these two. The top three riders in the Tour de France are now in the first three positions in this group. Escartin is, hang is hanging on well in fourth place. Ivan Gotti 
And also trying to get back on terms too is Laurent Jalabert, but they're in a little bit of trouble now as they're further down the slopes of the tour. This rider now sending out the tempo. Madras hasn't got on either. And this is Marco Pantani. You can now see the chalets of this famous ski station. It really only opens for a couple of days for the arrival of the Tour de France. Within two days of the tour leaving here, everybody will be packing their bags, including the hotel staff, and going back home for the summer. Because this is very much a winter resort, Alpdues. And Marco Pantani, I wonder if uh, he can even recall the days. He won't recall them because he wasn't around in 1952, of course, when Fausto Coppi, the great Italian Campanissimo, was the first man to conquer Alpdues. And then it was the 70s before we came back again. The only other Italian to have won up here is Gianni Bugno, and he's done it twice. And Bugno having an extremely quiet Tour de France this year. But at least we can see the Italian flags. It now seeks out Ivan Gotti and Laurent Jalabert. Jalabert, of course, a Frenchman, speaks fluent uh, Spanish because he rides on the Once team. The parting of the ways, how often have we seen this uh, for all of the great cyclists in the Tour de France who conquer Alp d'Huez first? And now the barriers are here because in the days where we used to see Fabio Parra, Lucho Herrera come up, the crowd got so close the riders were almost brought to a standstill. So the barriers go further and further down this mountain every year. And it gives more room to work now for Indurain. Nobody has helped him whatsoever. As he passes under the three kilometres to go, Banner, he's still over a kilometre behind Marco Pantani. So Pantani is safe now for the victory, and Indurain is going to be safe in that yellow jersey too. The second and final day in the Alps. And everything going the way of Miguel Indurain, but he had to work for it. He was second yesterday. And there's an outside chance he can still finish second a day, unless, of course, Zula or Reese manage to jump him in the last kilometre, because just after the kilometre sign, you've come onto the plateau of the town of Alpduez, and then it kicks up again just before the line. And Marco Pantani, his head especially shaved for the Tour de France, and note that he still uses the down tube shifters rather than the STI on the brake levers. It doesn't seem to slow him down any, he's got his rhythm going, and so too is this man now, Miguel Indurain, but just look at the crowd here. It is a beautifully hot summer's day here on Alp d'Huez. And Laurent Jalabert again is doing a great ride up the mountain. So the sprinter really is becoming a true all-rounder. He's on the climb at the moment in around about seventh position. Marco Pantani now in the closing kilometres of Alp d'Huez. He'll now stay in amongst the houses until he makes the final left turn up to the finishing line. The town that comes alive just for a few days in the height of summer for the Tour de France. And now Indurain, still finding the effort, will not allow anybody to gain time on him. And the reason he's keeping his pace high here right now is to try and stop Alex Zula or Bjorn Arish jumping him in the last kilometre. And still we have alongside Ivan Gotti here is Lange Jalabert taking a quick drink. And it looks to me as though Jalabert is going to finish this now and he's going to have to take a hard look at the overall classification tonight and say to himself, well... I might well have to go for a high finish in Paris. Indurain still got that beautiful position, still using all of his concentration. Just look at the difference in style between him and Alex Zula. Zula's working extremely hard now to hang on to Miguel Indurain. Indurain locks solid. This all that tells us the problem is his face. Very good steady rhythm. Very different style to that of Alex Zula and Bjorn Arisa. Bjorn Arisa has done the ride on Alp d'Huez today. He has suffered. He has come back at least twice to the side of these riders on the climb. And now he's going to hang on. And who knows, he might get the advantage of the finish here because he's a fighter. Indurain second yesterday. Losing time today only to Marco Pantani. Pantani should come up the overall classification, but he's not come up... He's not going to come anywhere like close enough to take the yellow jersey away from Miguel Indurain. Under the kilometre to go, Banner. Marco Pantani riding to victory. Who would have thought that? He was unable to start in the Tour of Italy. He said he'd come here. He didn't know what his form was like. He gave us some indication in the Tour of Switzerland. Now he's showing us his form is very good indeed. Although it's not quite the Marco Pantani of one year ago. Even so, he's got his rhythm, he's got the gap, and he's shortly going to get his stage win as well. An enormous crowd, as big as we've ever seen up here. Funny enough, uh, with the demise of the top Dutch riders, we don't see so many Dutch people coming here anymore because they always used to win on top of Alp Duez, Henny Kuyper, Peter Winnen, etc. Gert-Jan Ternisse. 
But now those riders have all retired, turning to giving up this season, just after it started, in fact. And now we're looking at the Italians taking control of Alp Duez as well. This will be the third Italian victory. And by a different Italian, it's the fourth Italian victory, because Gianni Bugno has won twice here. And the crowd very orderly indeed is now Marco Pantani. I would say without doubt he's going to have the greatest moment of his cycling career. This young man now coming to turn left in... Well, you're supposed to turn left, Marco. That's in fact the, the way the cars go off the course. Uh, the riders go hard left, but there's no need to worry. He may have lost a second. It really doesn't matter. In the last 200 metres now, as he lines up for the finish, Marco Pantani is going to win his stage. So after the lone victory yesterday of Alex Zula to win his first stage of a Tour de France, we now have Marco Pantani, the greatest climber, currently riding the circuit, sprinting the victory here on what is certainly the mecca of cycling. Marco Pantani will win. He won't get the yellow jersey, but he certainly will gain time today. He's been in the saddle five and a quarter hours. This is the race now for second place in Jurain Zula. Reese yo-yoing on and off the back wheel of Alex Zula, but this is the plateau I was telling you about. Now in Jurain knows the way better than anybody to the top of Alp Duez. I'm quite sure he won't make the mistake of going straight on. This is the left turn now. He takes it very quickly, very wide to force Zula and Reese to the far right. In fact, took it so well there, he gained a length over the field, and that might be good enough to get second in as many days in the Alps because now in Jurain is coming clear. The gap is not enormous. Thomas either just over a minute and a quarter as Miguel Ingerain comes to the line. Zula has not got it and neither has Bjorn Arise. This is the order of the top three overall in the Tour de France and that's how they crossed the finishing line. So the two days in the Alps have proved Miguel Ingerain to be as strong as ever and they've given the great climber Pantani the victory. So it was a win for Marco Pantani, a minute and 24 seconds ahead of Miguel Ingerain, who finished with Alex Zula. Bjorn Arise was fourth. And by the way, Laurent Jalabert finished seventh. Ingerain now leading the Tour de France by 2 minutes 27 seconds ahead of Alex Zula. Bjorn Arise is third. And this morning, the riders have come away from Alp d'Huez to the village which nestles at the bottom of the mountain, Bourg d'Oison. It is going to be a very hot day in the saddle, and the competition in this record-breaking tour we can assure you will be hot as well. Now, apart from Miguel Ingerain's leader's yellow jersey, there are two other major competitions in the Tour de France. The polka dot jersey for the leader of the King of the Mountains and the green jersey for the Tour's most consistent daily finisher. French riders are on top of the tables in both cases. Here's Paul Sherwin now to explain more. Laurent Jalabert is the current leader in the points competition with a 17-point lead over second-place rider Jamaluddin Abdujaparov. The green jersey for the most consistent rider was introduced into the sport to designate the most regular finisher on each individual stage. Today, Abdujaparov will try to score points in the hotspot sprints, which are in designated towns along the race route. Here, the first three men across the line will get six, four and two points. However, he won't forget the stage finish, where most points can be gained. Richard Virenc currently leads the mountains competition with a 63-point advantage over Alex Zula. Points are awarded in this competition for the first riders to cross designated mountain passes. The more severe the mountain, the higher the points that can be gained. Virenc is firm favourite for this competition, but one bad day in the Pyrenees could change all that. Thanks, Paul. Paul showing there, seven times a rider in the Tour de France. Stage 11 now, Bourg d'Oison to Saint Etienne, 199 kilometres, just 143 riders are left. And the town of Bourg d'Oison, as the riders roll away, the Alps are now behind them, but the hills certainly aren't as we get towards the finish now because St Etienne is in a valley, but there are some very tough roads that bring the race into the finishing a town of the cycling capital of France. The majority of the bicycle manufacturers have or, or are still in production here. And this breakaway now by Bueno Hora and Max Chianri as they come over the top of the Col de Louillon. And they're the survivors of a breakaway, and Chiandri has done most of the work here, and the little Kelme rider has done well to hold on to him. This is the main field, they are generally coming back together again. And Buenohora and Chiandri, 6 minutes 46 seconds, still surviving of the long breakaway today. Now, I wonder who will claim the victory if Chandri is to win because he has a British racing licence and a British passport, but indeed he spent all of his life living in Italy and his first language, without doubt, is Italian. Ex-Motorola team rider, now with the MG team. 
And the field here having more or less a rest day now. Miguel Indrain has got his Benesto team in control of the head of the field. Five kilometres to go on this descent. Uh, thankfully, it's dry. It was on this descent where Ronan Pensek crashed a couple of years ago in torrential rain. And so did Lucio Herrera. And this is Shianri. He's got the front, but I don't think he really wanted it because it's a long, sweeping left-hand bend up to the line here. And Shianri is a good sprinter, but he doesn't know too much about Buena Hall, who's had a great ride today. And Shianri keeping tight on the barriers and waiting for a move from the Kelme rider. But the Kelme rider is going to wait right to the line. And Shandy is being forced now to pick up the tempo as the finishing line approaches. Now he's going to have to go for it. And he will not be happy at leading it out because sprinters must come from behind. That's the rule book. But now Shandy is going. Is he strong enough? And I'm judging by the way that Buena Hora is sprinting, Shandy won't have a problem here. And almost two minutes, 40 seconds gone now. This is the sprint for third place. Rolf Aldag for Telecom is going to get the better of Andrea Taffy. And he does on the line. He gets third. This is the bunch sprint now. The green jersey of Laurent Jalabert cleans up. And so Jalabert finishes in seventh place. But Max Chiandri was the winner today. Now, is he English or Italian? Dedicated to all the English people on the Tour de France, you know. To myself and to the team, you know. I mean, it's a win from myself. Everybody asking me, who is it, an Italian or an English win? It's, uh, it's Chiandri's win. <laughs> So, Max Chiandri winning for himself, ahead of Hernan Buenohora, Ralph Aldug and Andrea Taffy. Armand de las Cuevas, a good place for him in sixth. After stage 11, Miguel Indurain still leading by the same time difference of 2 minutes 27 seconds, as the race then started to head out to a new Finnish town of Mond. This was stage number 12, 222 and a half kilometres, 140 riders still surviving of the 189 who started in the rain in Brittany. And this is July the 14th, Bastille Day, and there's a French rider now in the breakaway, Laurent Jalabert, and this is a tremendous move by Anse, and for the first time I could ever recall, Miguel Indurain has been in a state of panic behind. He was left without his Bonesto team around him, they've got back to him now, but this breakaway has gone. Now the back of the group there in the pink, uh, that is Neil Stevens, because Anse have three riders here at the moment on what is a very undulating course indeed. The original breakaway that went at 50 kilometres contained Laurent Jalabert, Melchor Maori and Neil Stevens, all of Anse, and joining them are Dario Bataro, Andrea Perone and Massimo Podenzano, the former champion of Italy. And Perone is from Motorola and the other rider, Bataro, is from Gavis. And just look at this gap, 8 minutes and 40 seconds. Laurent Jalabert is now becoming a real star of this year's Tour de France. He is now the race leader on the road. Miguel Indurain is going to have to do something about it sooner or later. Now, I'm wondering if the rest of the Tour de France will leave him alone to start to counter the move. It's a very, very hot day indeed. This is Richard Varenc going over the top of this small climb at the head of the main field. Still no signs of a counter-attack coming. Now, today the race finishes at Men, but in fact it finishes outside of the town because there's a very nasty climb up to a plateau where the airfield is, where they land the light aircraft, and in fact the race finishing on the runway up there above the town. And Jalabur has relied heavily, particularly on the early pacemaking by Neil Stevens, and latterly by the pacemaking by Melchor Mari, who really does to have found, to have rediscovered his old form, which won in the Tour of Spain a few years back now. And so we're in the town now of Mend, and this is the start of the climb, five kilometres to the summit, and still Melchor Maori setting the pace. We've dropped Neil Stevens. he went uh, on the previous climb, and in fact, Jalabert sent Maori back to ask him if he was feeling OK, and should they wait over the top for him to come back, but apparently Stevens said, no, I'm done for. So Stevens has gone back towards the field, the gap is still significant, and Melchor Maori is now, I can assure you, trying to springboard Jalabert to victory here. The Anse team have been absolutely magnificent as a team in this year's Tour de France. They're winning the team race and they deserve that certainly. And now Melchor Maori is trying to pace Jalabert to a rare French victory on Bastille Day. The last one, by the way, was Vincent Barteau. And in fact, Jalabert has gone. He's left himself a long way to ride on this climb. But let's not forget his big time gains at the moment over Miguel Indurain. Jalabert is heading up towards the top of the Tour de France tree today, quite literally. And it looks to me as though, in fact, Patalo has tried and failed to grab his wheel. He chose the right man, but can he get on? Maybe he can, because Patalo is closing slightly. 
Jalaber staying out of the saddle with this attack. And it's time to move those motorcyclists further away now as Lord Jalaber rides clear, looks over his shoulder just for a split second. Sees a Dario Bataro trying to get back on terms. Maori is gone now after his great pace making. Andrea Perone has also gone, so too is Massimo Podenzana. So Laurent Jalabert, the green jersey of the, this year's Tour de France, a previous winner of it too. In fact, they shared it the last few years. He and Jamaluddin Abdu Japarov. And it looks as though the first couple of weeks of close fighting between Abdu Japarov and Jalabert for the green jersey is now swinging very definitely the way of this man. He's proved so consistent in the mountains where you can score points where sprinters can't. Jalabert has gone very early and that's the way to do it because now he must surely be thinking of yellow as well as green. This has been a tremendous Tour de France and thanks largely to the work of the Anse team who have attacked Indurain at every possible opportunity. Yes, we've had the intruders like Marco Pantani. Evgeny Berzino for Gaywiz has been simply a sporting disaster and was never in this race till he abandoned it in the Alps. So Gaywiz are unsettled, Onsay couldn't be closer together. Jalabert, every time he senses the rhythm is dropping, he gets out of the saddle and keeps it going. And there's no one going to get on terms with him now. He waited till he came to the foot of the climb. He used his teammates, Melchior Mary, to set the pace. And now he's been in the lead for just over one and a half kilometers. He's got three to go. And the top of this climb is not too bad either. I'm not sure, in fact, uh, whether he knows it, but I would expect him to know it because he does live not too far away. Six minutes and 51 seconds, an enormous gap still back to Miguel Indurain. This is a significant time gain now as well because the main field is just down through the town of Mund. Jalabert started the day almost 10 minutes behind and he's now recouped six minutes at the moment. These are big time gains today and should never have been imagined. But Miguel Indurain was in a state of panic very early on. And in fact, his team manager came up to him and told him not to panic because the race would reorganize itself. So that is a sign of perhaps getting a little bit older. You're not sure of your form. Pantani now going to have another go as the roads go uphill. He always attacks. Vishar Vareng still there and consolidating that lead in the King of the Mountains. And Miguel himself now. It's all being left to Miguel Indurain. Now indeed, Zula and Reese have an interest in this escape. They could lose second or third overall. And they're using Pantani this time. They're trying to use him as a pacemaker. Zula is actually helping Miguel Indurain. Not that he wants to, but he wants to hold on to second place overall. Indurain still in a little bit of trouble there. Bjorn Reese, a rider who always seems to dig deep into his reserves, suffers but holds his position. Lon Brochard was also trying to get on the action there, just tacked onto the back of them. They're having a little problem here containing Pantani. But he still hasn't quite got the zip in his legs he had last year. But this man, well, last year ended on day one in the Tour de France for him when he had that terrible crash along with Wilfred Nelson and Gonchenko. But now he's riding so well. Pantani trying to get up there for second place. But he's not going to do it. There's still one or two of the remnants of the breakaway in between at the moment. Podenzana, Bataria, Melchior, Mari, Peron, they're all so far ahead, they're still in front of this group. But this is where the action is, this is where the time is being lost or gained, depending on how Indurain is going. Now, they're more or less the top of the climb, and then the fault's flat, he can slip it up a gear and head downhill towards the airfield. Pantani still riding on the road at round about 6th or 7th here, and still six and a half minutes back. And surely Indurain is going to have to go alone. <laughs> but he's got for company the champion of Denmark. Now where has Alex Zuller gone? Zuller is in a little bit of trouble, I think, because the three of them have gone clear. Zuller is in trouble. Lange Alibur is certainly not. He goes into the last kilometre dead straight as the aeroplane lands. Runway 23 and the man first to touch down is Lange Alibur. 
He's got about five or six hundred metres to go to the line and become the first French winner on Bastille Day since 1989 and Vincent Barteau. But more than that, the day could not have worked out better for him. He is gaining tremendous time over Miguel Indurain. He could well be in the top three tonight. Well, he looks over his shoulder not to see where Miguel is, but to see where probably Bataro is or Poddenzana. They were the riders immediately behind him on the road. But this has been a superb attack, a tactic that has worked so well. They spotted the peloton was in disarray, they spotted Injuray was in trouble, and not just one on say went clear, but three of them. And they worked to get this man home first today, a long breakaway that's worked to perfection. Up goes the zip on the green jersey. Shortly, Laurent Jalabert will enjoy the moment. Jalabert of France. A magical tour continues for him, the green jersey. He's now going to have a high place overall in the overall classification. He must think of a high finish in Paris now. And in fact, Poddenzana has got up for second place. Last two years, he's been the champion of Italy. That's gone across this year, just a week before the Tour de France, to Gianni Bugno. And Poddenzana gets second. Just around about 28 seconds back. And then it looks like Bataro finishing third, but this is the race that matters. Uh, this indeed now is the race for a lot further down. It's the race for seventh place. They've caught Pantani. Injurain is still a few minutes back, but a question of how many. The clock hasn't told it for a little while, but it will shortly now. You see, Bjorn Arise knows how important the attack is by Jalabert. He knows his top place is being forfeited here. He's third overall, but he could be fourth or even fifth after this. He looks over for more speed from Injurain. Look at the clock. Five minutes is the gap. So Reese has lost third overall, certainly now. Pantani having to hang on to Reese and Zula noticeably has gone. So Alex Zula is losing time now in his second slot overall as well. A great day indeed for Laurent Jalabert. Injurain seems to be salvaging just enough to keep his yellow jersey though. As Reese now goes forward, followed by Pantani. Injurain has given just about everything now. I think he's hanging on to the back of these two. Even Pantani's finding the legs to sprint as Reese goes to take his wheel. And still the clock counts towards six minutes. Pantani leads them home. Reese and Injurain. Five minutes, 40 seconds the gap. And this is Alex Zula. He's losing 20 or 30 seconds on the overall leader, which will still be Miguel Injurain. But Jalabert is now the new challenger. Zula finishes. 5.58 down on Jalabert. So Laurent Jalabert has won the stage here on Bastille Day. The green jersey. And at last, Jalabert forces a smile. So look at this for a result. Jalabert, 29 seconds in front of Poddenzana, but notably 5 minutes and 41 ahead of Pantani and Injurain. Overall now, Injurain, 2.44, increases his lead over Zula. Jalabert comes in to third place. So the race has had a shock. It turned upside down now as Jalabert up to third and Reese up to fourth. Melchor Mauri up again into fifth. On to stage number 13, Mond to Ravel. 245 kilometres, 134 riders survive. And again, we, we should, I suppose, have expected a day when the race turned off. It's turned off, a breakaway has gone clear. And in that breakaway of almost 200 kilometres today, Lance Armstrong of Motorola has found a place among the leaders. The rider going through at the front, Sergei Uchikov. And there are just a couple of other riders left in this breakaway now, including Buena Hora in the green there. And Buena Hora was the rider who got beat in the sprint by Max Chandri down at St Etienne. The Bonesta boys have taken a real control of the race. They're allowing nobody to move. There is nobody in this breakaway who is going to affect the overall situation tonight. Now, can Lance Armstrong win for him his second ever stage of a Tour de France? He came in in such a big way in his first full season as a pro when he won a stage up in the north of France. Now we are down in the far hot south. He must be feeling confident. This is the small hill, just on the back of the circuit, before they swing around towards the finishing line. They do one little extra lap. And the bunch is so far behind, there's almost the risk they'll overlap the leaders, but not to be. Uchikov has gone, and Lance has found the effort to reach him. 
Now, what about Buenohora? Are they going to go with Buenohora? Or indeed, uh, will they just blow him away? Buenohora has become a little bit of a star. He's only ridden one Tour de France before this. He finished 18th overall. And now he keeps appearing in so many escapes, he's going to find himself in the top 10 if he keeps this up. But he's gone this time. That acceleration by Sergei Uchikov, the man who won a stage of this year's Tour of Italy, is enough to split the field. But this is a sad sight. This is further back. Hey, just got tendonitis. So there's no what point in continuing. No, it just came yesterday, but I've had it before in the Tour de Dupont, and it was just like one way. Your bike? It's on the Sean Yates in his 12th Tour de France, certainly his last, has abandoned with tendonitis while his teammate Lance Armstrong is going towards what he hopes will be now a victory on this stage here at Ravel. The last time the race finished here, it was the little Frenchman Charlie Motte who won. He's now part of the Tour de France organisation. Now, watch the flicks here. It's a difficult approach. They go right, then they swing left. And Lance Armstrong really uh, should be claiming second place here to line up for the finish. He wants it. Now has he got it? Yes, indeed he has. He's got back into second now. He's forced Uchikov to take the lead. Now Armstrong will sit there as long as he can. It's a very difficult sprint now, a long straight sprint. And surely Armstrong feels he can win this now. Uchikov does as well, I think. He's turned off. He's now waiting for Armstrong to make his move. And Uchikov has ridden the Tour de France twice before. He's finished both times. He's never won a stage. Armstrong has never finished the Tour de France, but he has won a stage. And he's concentrating, he's waiting till the last possible minute here to take on Sergei Uchikov. Now he's going, Armstrong is now coming, but Uchikov has a kick. And look at this, Sergei Uchikov has got, and I don't think Armstrong can get round him. He's making absolutely no impression. Lance Armstrong is going to be beaten. And Uchikov for the Ukraine gets the victory on this stage of the Tour de France. And that is absolutely amazing. Were you surprised how quick Uchikov was when it came to the line? Because you still looked pretty good yourself. Mm, I, I was surprised. How, I mean, they said he was fast, but I, I didn't think it was that fast. How does it feel to get so close to a stage victory in the Tour after 93? It's been a long time. No, it's, it's terrible. It's, it's terrible. <laughs> I mean, I really feel bad. I can't tell you how disappointed I am. But so... I was out there 200 Ks and every 200 of them, every one of them, I thought for sure I was going to win. And to get second is, that's devastating. But you're going to carry this tour right through until the end and there's still a couple more chances. There is, yeah. I mean, it's a day like today was, you don't come across very often to go into a break and get 15 or 17 minutes. And I mean, those, those days just don't happen. And oh, I mean, I'm always looking, but it's going to be difficult. Great sadness for Lance Armstrong, who really should have won that, but Sergei Uchikov was the victor, and he got it for the Ukraine. The weather has now changed as the riders face up to the mountains of the Pyrenees. So Lance Armstrong yesterday bitterly disappointed, and we don't expect Armstrong now to be in the attacks when they come up to here. This is Gozenej in the Pyrenees, and as you can see, it is very dreary indeed. Low cloud and light rain. The overall situation on Miguel Indurain's birthday is that he leads Alex Zula, Laurent Jalabert, and Bjorn Arise. Let battle commence. And this first day in the Pyrenees, not a very long one at 164 kilometers, but indeed extremely tough, finishing on the climb of Guze Neige. Well, happy birthday. 31 years of age now, Miguel Indurain. He always celebrates his birthday on the Tour de France, and it seems he always celebrates wearing the leader's yellow jersey. Well, this is now the third small climb of the day. It's a second category climb, and we're heading up the start of the Port de Lairs. 131 kilometres cover when they get to the top, and Tony Rominger now trying to stretch the legs, especially of Miguel Indurain. The day started well, by the way, for Jamaluddin Abdu Japarov. He beat uh, into third place in the sprint after 23 kilometres, Lange Jalabur. So he's picked up four points in that green jersey competition, while it looks as though Indurain has now sent Gonzalez Arieta to try and keep a tight rein on Tony Rominger. This really is the first time we've seen Rominger attack this race since we started. So perhaps he's feeling a little bit better. 
He really did nothing at all in the Alps, but so often the riders who come to the Pyrenees after a bad session in the Alps ride better. Those that ride well in the Alps, I have to say, often don't ride so well. But it looks as though this man's going to ride well, Marco Pantani. He won in the Alps, and now he's off again. And this is on the climb of the Port de Lairs. It's a long, long climb to the summit. And Pantani is now going again. He has to go early if he's thinking of a long-term high ride on the general classification, simply because he's got a lot of time to make up. And if he's just thinking of the stage win, well, I think Pantani could have waited probably until the start of the climb of Gouzet Neige itself. It's a very difficult area around this area of France and the Pyrenees. The roads are beautiful, especially if you're riding a touring bicycle. You can duck and dive almost any turn will take you up a different mountain. But today, this is a very hard route indeed. It finishes on the Col de la Trap before they descend and climb the Côte de Gouzet Neige. Now, this is the group containing uh, Miguel Indurain. It's thinning out a little bit, but they've got Rominger in their sights, and he seems a little bit demoralized to me, Tony Rominger. Now Bjarne Rees is going to have a go. Rees fourth overall, and don't forget he's in a little bit of trouble with the proximity of Laurent Jalabert. Kilometre to go, to go now to the top of the Port de l'Air. And Pantani still has that beautiful rhythm of a climber. And the rain now settling on the camera lens. Here is our daily visit to the devil, who always cheers the riders over the last few kilometres. About ten days ago in the north of France, by the way, one of the riders just glanced over to see him and slammed into an obelisk in the road and crashed. And so uh, he didn't enjoy his visit to the devil. And Tony didn't throw him a glance. Keeps the rhythm going, like all good climbers. They have this superb art of concentration. Now, Indurain has got his little group together, and judging by one or two stragglers, he's uh, turned the screw that little bit tighter. But Pantani, at least, is going over the top of the Port de Lairs in the lead. Indurain, I don't think he's going to catch him that quickly. But he's now started the reaction. And just look at the cloud here now as we reach the summit of this climb. Well, there's plenty more waiting at the summit of Gouzet Neige as well, but the rain here is quite heavy. And the clock on the left now counting down since the passage over the top of the Port de Lairs by Pantani. Indurain has now been joined by Alex Zula, the man that was rid of on the climb to Mons, surprisingly so, but not so today. And number 51, that magic number in the Tour de France, it's won it more times than anything else, is now on the back of Richard Varenk, who is struggling to hold contact on the climb. Rhys is the man causing the pain, and the clock still counts down, so it looks approaching a minute now since Pantani went over the top. Rhys, Indurain, Zula is the order, and in fact, uh, Indurain, yes, Indurain gets second over the summit ahead of Bjorn Rhys and Alex Zula. Varenk a little bit off the pace. And conditions down the other side, not for the nervous. On the way down, this very wet descent, which will take them towards the Col de la Trappe, and that coming uh, as a stepping stone right up to the finish. There we are, the yellow dot signifying this is the climb now of the Col de la Trappe. And in fact, Marco Pantani looks to be doing exactly what he did on the climb of Alpe d'Huez, and that's win the stage at the top of a mountain. The two best stages in the Tour de France that any climber will want to win is the top of Alpe d'Huez and the top of Gouzet Neige, and Pantani now looks set to do just that. So, he's no real chance, we don't think, of uh, claiming a top three position in the overall, and surprisingly, he hasn't challenged Richard Varenk at all in the points competition for the King of the Mountains. He's only chosen the days he wants to succeed, and he's ridden in a back seat on the other days of this year's tour, which indicates, of course, he hasn't quite got the great form of a year ago. But he'll be back. Coming up towards the top of La Trappe, and he's still now well in the clear. He's got over a minute advantage at the last time check. And he's not much further to go now. It's not a very long descent of La Trappe. Then you make a hairpin left, shortly continue descent, only for a matter of a kilometre, and then you go up the hill. Interesting to note, though, we had Neil Stevens up here amongst the leaders, and in fact setting the pace now. And Neil is such a great domestique for the Onse team. The young Aussie rider almost won the stage last year at Montpellier. He's beaten in the sprint by Rolf Sons of Denmark, who incidentally is not in the race this year. Five kilometres to go, so the climb of Guzé Neige has started for Marco Pantani, just three short miles from another great stage victory in this year's tour. And the rider trying to chase him down, but he's still a fair way behind him, is Laurent Madouas, the rider who rode so well in the mountains of the Alps and now will try and shine even brighter here in the Pyrenees. Trained by Cyril Guimard, the man who's trained more winners of the Tour de France than any other manager, and don't forget, he also trained the great Greg Lamond. 
So Pantani riding up towards the mist, but hopefully the weather not as bad as it was a few hours ago. And Indurain again is being forced to chase, but this time at least he's got some team around him. And he'll be thankful for that, the pressure off him a little bit. Because there is now another battle going on just behind him between Laurent Jalabert and Bjorn Arise. And they're trying to settle out the rightful owner of the third position in this year's Tour de France. And I think Indurain will have noted that. A minute 47 now, so in fact, uh, and 3.16, so Indurain is dropping back. While in fact, Laurent Madras is closing in on Marco Pantani. But I don't think he's going to close in quick enough. That's the big Indurain group, and isn't it a big one, which indicates the pressure perhaps not as great as it was in the Alps. Another rider tries Reese. Reese is trying to go clear here. Now, Reese is so frisky in this year's tour. He's now trying to get a few seconds, which will help him take third place back in the Tour de France. He needs a, about a minute and a half to get it back at the moment. He's off in pursuit of Laurent Madouas. Again, the sky is darkening and the mist is coming down. Little cheer there from the French. And Marco Pantani dancing on the pedals now as he heads up towards the finish of today's stage. The result will be a little bit of a climb up the overall classification. Not a great one, but he's not too worried about that. The man they call Dumbo. Well, he's laughing at the whole race uh, in both the Pyrenees and the Alps. Indurain has thinned the group out a little bit, again being left to make all of the pace now. And Gotti is there once more. He really has been a discovery. He's able to ride alongside Bjorn Arisi's teammate. What a valuable ally that would be. If Reese were to have a problem now, I'm sure Gotti would be passing his bike over. And the eternal shadow of Miguel is Alex Zula. He may have shaken him off on the climb up to Mond yesterday, but today is a different day. And indeed, he's now settling in again on the wheel of Big Mig. Despite the weather, a marvellous crowd here, and it lines all the way up to the finish. Laurent Madras is responding well. It's a very difficult approach for the riders. You may remember a few years ago, Robert Miller went the wrong way. He misread a policeman's instruction. And uh, in fact, uh, where we dive down to the left here now, this is the road that leads us to what is known as Miller's Corner. And Miller probably would have won the stage that day. In fact, uh, he had to be content with the place. Slightly downhill, a little bit of a false flat before you swing up towards the finishing line at Gouzet Neige. This is really a back road approach to cope with the tour and the spectators. They were sent the other way and as you can see weren't allowed down there. But now it's all over. Marco Pantani seeks the lower gears and he makes the hairpin bend. Very difficult climb out. But Pantani is now going to add the second big mountain stage to his honours list here in the tour. This has been a wonderful tour for him now. He won a stage of the Tour of Switzerland to prove he was getting form. Now he's won the two toughest climbing stages of this year's Tour de France. And Marco Pantani is sprinting out of the mist here to victory. He'll be in the top seven overall for sure, but that's about where it will stay. Pantani gets the stage. Now the clock starts. Miguel Indurain, two minutes has passed now since Indurain came into sight of the finishing line. Gotti is still there. Zula is still hanging on to his wheel. Indurain again is going for gold. He seems to be the man. Madwas has hung on. Madwas is approaching the line, but Indurain is coming for it to try and get three second places in a row in the mountains. He got two in the Alps. Now he wants this day in the Pyrenees as well. Madwas is digging ever so deep. And will the finishing line come? Yes, it will. But in the same time, Indurain, Zula, Gotti and Rees as they cross the line, two and a half minutes behind the day's winner. Richard Varenk, the polka dot jersey, leader of the King of the Mountains. He scored again today. He'll keep the leader's jersey. But Reese has gained a little bit of time over Laurent Jalabert. And Jalabert taking on Richard Varenk now for the sprint at the top of a mountain. And Jalabert gets the better. Jalabert Varenk next over the line. 323. Tony Rominger hit the wall. He tried to attack. He has paid the price in full. So, a win for Marco Pantani, who really is the true king of the mountains in this year's Tour de France. For Laurent Jalabert, he continues to gain a lot of ground in the green jersey, and the same must be said, too, of the king of the mountains, Richard Varenk. Pantani, though, two and a half minutes ahead of Madoise, Indurain, Zula, 2.33. Rees was sixth.
And that was the situation at the start of stage 15 today and between saint Giron and Coteray, 206 kilometres, crossing some of the most famous climbs in any Tour de France. The Porte d'Aspe, the Col de Monte, the Col de Persaud, the Col d'Aspin, the Col du Tourmalet, and finally the climb to Coteray, where, incidentally, Miguel Indurain first won a stage of the Tour de France. At 11.31, Radio Tour reported a crash on the descent of the Pyrenean mountain, the Col de Porte d'Aspe. It involved six riders. One of those riders, Dante Rezze, plunged 30 feet into a ravine, yet he escaped with relative minor injuries. Fabio Casatelli was not so lucky. Severe facial injuries left him unconscious on the road. He was attended by the race doctors immediately, and then he was airlifted by helicopter to hospital. It was in the helicopter where he suffered a series of cardiac arrests, but on each occasion, the doctors saved him. On arrival at Tarb Hospital, doctors fought to save his life. At 3 o'clock, the race organization announced the passing of the Olympic champion who leaves a wife and a young baby. And the tragedy left behind on the road of the Tour de France today. The riders in the lead know nothing about it yet. One kilometre to go now for Richard Varenk, who has been a man of the race today, and sadly, I think few will remember it. He's celebrating here what will be a great victory for Richard Varenk. He has taken maximum points in the King of the Mountains. He's topped every climb in the lead. The Porte d'Aspe went over in the lead in the group. The Col de Monte, then on to the Col de Perosord, the Col d'Aspin and the Col de Tourmalet. Varenk has been first over the top in them all. This has been an escape in the true tradition of the Tour de France. And what a great sadness it is too of what has happened today. And Richard Varenk will probably not be remembered for this marvellous occasion. Varenk now coming up towards the finish, the final gear change before he takes the victory at the top here of Coteray. He's a very popular Frenchman, he shed everybody today, he started in a small breakaway group one by one, he watched them all disappear. On the Col de Perisor, Claudio Chiapucci finished second, Buena Hora went over third, now Richard Varenk is clear. This has been a day in the Pyrenees in the past when Kier Pucci has been top dog. Well, today it is the Frenchman, Richard Varenk, and this has more or less convinced everybody he's going to win the King of the Mountain for a second year. He's gained so many points today now. His lead is going to be enormous. One more tough day in the Pyrenees to come tomorrow, but this will be the day that he will remember. But sadly for everybody else, it'll be for a different reason. This is the sprint now for second place. And Claudio Chiapucci comes over just behind, a minute and 17 seconds down. And Bjorn Reese has managed to slip Miguel Indurain here. Zula is hanging on grimly. Reese is stealing a few seconds as they come up to the line. As Abuena Horn, a third escort team is fourth. Reese comes in fifth. Then Indurain just comes in ahead of Alex Zula and Laurent Madouas there again. Reese has gained a little bit of time though on Laurent Jalabert. He will be happy with that. He'll be back in third place overall. So the result of this stage in the Pyrenees, Varenk wins from Kiapucci, Buena Hora, Escartin, Reese Indurain finishes 2 minutes 34 seconds behind, but his overall lead will not be endangered at all. He still leads this race by 2 minutes and 46 seconds over Alex Zula. Bjorn Reese is third, Jalabert is fourth. But the man that everybody's talking about today, rider 114, Fabio Casatelli. Henny Kuiper was there. We had a radio crash, but that's... We heard it also a hundred times. And okay, we came closer and then uh, over the board radio, our internal Motorola communication, uh, Jim Okwitz told me, hey, we need a bike for Fabio. And then we came closer and then we went out of the car and we saw the terrible uh, situation there. Last night, the American Motorola team, of whom Casatelli was a member, met to decide whether or not to continue in the event. And afterwards, team manager Jim Okovic gave this statement to Gary Imlach. He was a super kid, I'll tell you. If, when you think about uh, somebody that was a, a champion and someone that was, uh, had great character and someone that um, you were proud to be associated with, I think 
You, you were talking about Fabio Casertelli. So how are the rest of the team taking it? They're taking it hard, which uh, is expected. Um, it's not going to be easy for us. Um, but at the same time, we think that uh, Fabio's there behind us and, and wants to keep us keep us going and keep us in the race. And um, uh, the boys have decided to continue on uh, in, in his memory. Today, the Tour de France remembers Fabio Cassatelli. So the Tour de France is saddened now with the death of Cassatelli, and when the news was announced, the media fell silent on the commentary tribune. In fact, the Italian television immediately stopped their direct coverage from the race. Cassatelli is only the second rider in recent years to die on the road to the Tour de France. Tom Simpson was the other one back in 1967. Today, all of our thoughts are with the young Italian's family. The race yesterday did continue to its finish at Coteray, and I'm sure many of you were surprised by the apparent celebration when the race reached there. But the fact was, the riders didn't know of the tragedy out on the road until after that. Then many of them were reduced to tears. Some of them were clearly shocked and stunned. They'd all felt they'd lost a friend. Everyone, I think, had difficulty sleeping last night. I know most of us in, in Festina did. Um, because we have families too. That's the really the tragedy. The great tragedy is that his wife and his child have lost their father and husband. Yeah, I was, I was very close to it. I saw it happening, and uh, yeah, then then when you heard after the finish, you're you're shocked. And uh, I, I saw the Montreal team was was uh, at the other side of the road, and I said, I go there to. It's a little bit better this morning, but yesterday we, everybody feel, felt very bad. You, know? you, you sleep, you sleep bad, and I don't want to think about it. But I, it keeps it keeps coming in my mind, you know, and uh, it's so awful. I'm sorry to to say that, but. I think the best for all of us to to just to just let it let it pass. It's very difficult. Yeah, for me, the film was going on all night, and but still the race race will go on, and we can we can can do something today to remember Fabio, but uh, that's a tragedy. Um, I think probably we will certainly have a, a, a long period of, of uh, riding where, where, where we're not racing in respect uh, in his memory. Um, you know, I don't know, it remains to be seen. I'm going to go into the village now and just see with the other team captains what, you know, what the general consensus is to get some idea. And the result was the tour organisation immediately called, of course, for two minute silence at the start. So the Prunian town of Tarb paying homage to Fabio Casatelli, the Olympic champion. And the ride is now facing up to 237 kilometers to Po, another and final day indeed in the High Pyrenees. Stephen Swart nearest the camera here, the New Zealand member of Motorola, as the whole team leads the 
Tour de France away from Tarb. If you wanted to go to Po direct, by the way, it's approximately 40 kilometers. Or you have the choice. This is the other way. Two first category climbs on the way to a rather flat finish in a town which has seen the tour on many occasions. In fact, it ranks number three in the most visited list. Well, it's soon become apparent that the riders, to me, appear as though they're not going to race this stage at all. They are going to say their sorrows to the Italian cyclist Fabio Cassatelli. Nobody has attacked since he rolled out of the start, and in fact, Eric Boyer, despite the slow speed, has decided to call it quits in the tour. He's not well, and Boyer, who's finished fifth in the past, quite clearly distressed. So the Palti rider is out. And the Palti rider, apart from Bernesto, were running with most of their riders until the crash involving Casatelli yesterday when they lost their first man in Dirk Boldinger. And again, the riders on the climb of the Sulor here, and no signs of anybody attacking. And I'm quite certain now that there has been a truce call today and that no rider is going to attack. And as it turns out, this is without doubt the hottest day of the Tour de France. And that's Laurent Jalabert down there taking a drink. Miguel Indurain in the centre of the picture. Well, all of the spectators who travel out into the Pyrenees today know only too well the reason for this. Fabio Casatelli, he wasn't a prominent rider in the Motorola team or indeed in the Tour de France, but he was a rider one felt had the talent to succeed in the future. And ironically, this year, he seemed to be rid of all the injuries that have stopped him riding well as a professional. And the race now in the streets of Po, and in fact, it looks to me as though they've projected the whole of the Motorola team here to the front, and that nobody is going to pass them as they come up the hill round the back of the casino and head out towards the finishing area. On the top of the lead Motorola car, the bicycle of Casatelli. Well, this is a sad, sad moment for any sporting commentator to have to commentate on, and indeed for particularly the Motorola team. Andrea Perone, we just caught a glimpse of, he was the roommate of Casatelli, and of course the other Italian on the squad. The whole team have now been allowed to pedal clear of the Tour de France, and the Tour is holding off at a respectful distance. And you can see in the far distance there, as we go under the kilometre banner, the main pack of the tour, but the field is leaving them now. So a quiet moment of private grief as they come into the centre of Po. Frankie Andreu in second place, Lance Armstrong leading the line. Andrea Perone on the far side, Stephen Swart. Alvaro Mejia and Steve Bauer. It's only the second time in the history of the Tour de France a rider has died from injuries sustained in the event. And the Tour de France feels, quite rightly so, it's lost a member of its own family. So the arrival in Po, the team have spread out. There'll be no winner of this stage today, and indeed there'll be no results either. The general classification will simply remain unchanged. This day did not exist as a competitive day in the Tour de France. The Motorola team, freewheel over the line. Andrea Perone being allowed to cross over first as the Italian on the squad and the roommate of Casatelli. The main field, they come in at around about 15 or 20 seconds. That's certainly a very respectful distance. So the great city of Po, the gateway to the Pyrenees on so many occasions, this city has witnessed so many happier moments in the Tour de France. Now it pays its moment of tribute to a great cyclist. The Motorola team filed through, stunned photographers and journalists, none going across to speak to them. They also recognised the poignant moment. <clears throat> Max, that was, a, that was a great gesture out on the road today. Yeah, I think it's a very nice thing, you know, the, the, the whole group could do to, to remember Fabio because of Deadly. There's not much you can do, not much you can say, but... I think in this way everybody, you know, is together.
And what were your thoughts out on the road? It was a long stage. Yeah, it was a long stage. It was very hot, you know. I mean, people didn't really feel like talking today. I mean, there was not much talking going on. A lot of thinking, you know. You think of what happened, you know. It was him, but it could have been anybody. Tour de France goes on. We're now on to stage 17 here, 246 kilometers, 117 riders now heading towards Paris. 189 started the race. And this is a fair distance, this, mostly on flat roads, a little bit of a ripple at the beginning, running down to sea level. Ron Jalabert consolidating his overall points gain over Jamaluddin Abdou Japarov. Miguel Indurain is in third place after his great riding in the mountains. Well, this is San Juan, 58 kilometres covered, and Jalabert again scoring over Abdu Japarov in third place, Decker, Eric Decker, who was second in the Olympic road race, indeed, in which Fabio Casatelli was the winner. This is Georg Tochnig, the leader of the Palti team, one of the leaders we haven't seen much of this year, and in fact, riding his first Tour de France, he's still nonetheless in 36th place overall. He had a great Tour of Italy. But well, not surprisingly, the field, even today, haven't been too frisky over the first couple of hours of the course. This is an attack here by Ralph Yerman and the MG boys near the end now. They're about a kilometre and a half to go here. Yerman's got clear. He's got Flavio Vanzella with him, the rider that wore the yellow jersey briefly in the Tour last year. If they can just hang on, four kilometres to the line it is, and they're in the streets of Bordeaux, but unfortunately the weather finishes these days out at the lake. You've got something like five kilometres across the city before you get down to the finish. It is a sprinter's delight, and the whole field are not very far behind. That's why these two are looking over the shoulders, and there they are. And I don't think it's worth continuing. Rolf Herman and Flavio Vanzella, both on the same MG team are about to be swept up by the whole field. It does seem as though the sprinters are going to get a nice shot now at the gold medal today. And the Onsei team continue to keep this race in full flow at three kilometres to go. And I'm not surprised because they want Laurent Jalabert now to continue scoring in the green jersey competition. Jalabert lying fourth overall and looking for a higher finish than that, although I think that the, really the advantage for the high finish has now gone the way of Bjorn Arise because the time trial is still to come. But now this is going to be a great finish for the sprinters and Jesper Skibby now for TVM is having a go. Skibby tries so often to jump away and surprise. He's doing it again now. The big tall figure of Eros Poli is going with him. Poli and Skibby, two very strong men. They both won previously stages in the Tour de France. You may remember last year it was Poli who won after the climb of Mont Von 2. He gained so much time they didn't catch him by the finish down in the bottom. And just look at that line of riders now. And Skibby still trying to hang on with Poli. And they're just about going to hang on as they turn into the finishing area. One kilometre to go. This could be it. Skibby could have landed the big one here. He's so often the opportunist. But now there's another rider trying to scrabble across the gap here. The sprinters are finding that this is going to be a most difficult finish indeed. Over these last six or seven kilometres, the sprinters haven't been allowed to make their play at all. And that is Vyatislav Yekimov who's got across and he's jumped immediately. And that's all he really could do because he surprised the two in the front, now he's got to go for it the man who has held a lot of world records on pure speed, now needs all of that speed to hold off the whole of the Tour de France, Skibby has found the strength from somewhere to latch onto the back wheel of Yekimov, but the telecom team are coming very, very quickly indeed and in fact Skibby has surrendered and I think they've got Yekimov too, it's a long way to the finish here at Bordeaux Skibby's gone again, but Lombardi going on the right, so too is Jalabert on the far right Eric Zabel is coming on the left Zabel going for win number two, Jamaladi now Abdu Japarov in the centre. Zabel gets the line first, but just Abdu Japarov was very close. I think he'll get second, and it looked like Stefano Kolaje, the best finish for him so far this tour. I think he probably got third. And let's have a look at that sprint again. In the end, a clear win for Eric Zabel, who is the new up and coming sprinter. 
Eric, it's fantastic to get two stage victories at the Tour de France. Did you think going through the mountains about getting another one? Oh, I don't know. It's so, it's so. I'm now I'm so happy that I can the second win here takes in the Tour de France, and I'm very happy. I'm, and now I won't only go to Paris. It's been fantastic. The team did a great job for you today. You know, they nearly didn't even make the Tour de France. Yeah, we, we, we are the great team, and we are friends, and that's important. And we come only with five riders, uh, with six riders here to the Tour de France, and uh, the boys make the work for nine, and it's so great. Great is the word, Eric, and that victory. He climbed one place overall to 94, but I don't think he was too worried about that. All he wants to do now is get to Paris, and he could win again. He beat all of the top men here. Abdu Japarov was second. And the final preparations underway this morning at the finish line here in Limoges. Well, we are standing on top of what I think we call a false flat, but it is a gentle climb for two kilometres. It might be just enough to fool the sprinters today. But we all felt yesterday it would be a sprint finish, and many felt the winner would be Jamaluddin Abdu Japarov. What has happened to this rider this year? He hasn't won a stage yet. Here's Paul Sherry now to give us his opinion. The reason Jan Raas's Novell team signed Jamaluddin Abdu Japarov this year and paid him an estimated three quarters of a million pounds was because they wanted stage wins, like this one from last year by the Tashkent Terror. After all, he has won five stages in the past two years. In a sprint finish, he's always easy to spot because of his erratic sprinting style. That's why the other riders tend to give him plenty of space in which to work, as they know he feels that the whole road belongs to him. Abdu Japarov still has an awful lot of power as he uses all of his compact body, especially his strong arms and shoulders, to push and pull on the handlebars. But what he does appear to have lost is the suppleness needed to convert that power into pure speed. This is the first thing a rider tends to lose in advancing years. He may still be among the best sprinters in the world, but his force now is more effective in the slower, slightly uphill finishes. Despite dangerously dashing across the road in search of Eric Zabel on the approach to the line, from this overhead view, you can easily see the faster pedaling action of the German, who's almost seven years younger than Abdu Japarov. Well, perhaps it'll be today for Jamaluddin Abdu Japarov, the 18th stage in Montpellier -Mont Nesterol to Limoges, 166 and a half kilometers. And the riders begin to find themselves in a much better frame of mind now. The tragedy is a couple of days behind them. The sun is still shining and Paris is literally just around the corner. And there's Jamaldin Abdu Japarov having a little chat with his arch rival, Laurent Jalabur. Between them, they've dominated the green jersey competition these past few years. But last year, we were robbed of the competition, of course, because we lost Laurent Jalabur on stage number one. Just a little few ripples as we head towards Limoges. The finish itself is on that slightly uphill finish I've told you about, and it really is a difficult one to judge for a fast sprinter. And this breakaway may well spoil it all today because it's gone fairly early on. It contains the American Lance Armstrong. Number 123 here is Martin Denbacher, and there's Armstrong, 111. And there's nobody in this breakaway really to worry Miguel Indurain or the leaders of the tour. And so my bet is they're going to allow it to make time today. It could well be the move. And in fact, Armstrong is making a move right now. We're on the climb here of the Côte de Villeneuve and Armstrong is going clear. Now we've just uh, received a time check that the bunch is five minutes behind containing Indurain. So Armstrong knows now that the race will be decided from this front group and he's trying to force that decision even to a finer result. Now there's no immediate reaction here and I think the field is a little bit tired. In this group is Ralph Yerman, Gatislav Yekimov, Johan Brunil, Max Chiandri is up here. He's been very active all day in the breakaway. But now nobody has offered to take up the chase of Lance Armstrong. And look at the speed of him. He's gone not on the climb where everybody was watching, but as soon as they tipped over the summit, he went. And let's have a look at it again. There's Armstrong on the left, and they're still just coming up to the line here. And Armstrong then goes, while everybody, possibly a little distracted by that man on the right, waving something at the field, has gone down his right of the road. Well, there's Armstrong's overall position, 39th, almost an hour and a half behind Miguel Indurain. But, you know, most importantly this year, Lance Armstrong just had to finish this year's Tour de France. 
and if he wins a stage on the way that would be seen as a bonus because after two rides in the tour and no finish in Paris surely that works a little bit on the mental state now Armstrong knows he'll get to Paris he's free now to try for a stage win there's no more hills of note now before the finish except of course the little climb up to the line so if Armstrong can get a gap and hold it he's hovering around about 40 seconds and it's looking good right now he's not panicking he's holding his rhythm and he's using the road and that's something else often difficult to do the roads totally closed in France for the tour but you have to remember to go around the corners on the wrong side knowing that there won't be anything coming the other way the other problems are these central islands where the riders have to keep on dodging this is Martin Dembaka here who's trying now to get a little group to get up to Armstrong an interesting move Armstrong read it very very well indeed here now he's beginning to suffer just a little bit there's long straightaways and then the riders have to climb a little bit, then they descend. There's no serious climbs, but when you're trying to maintain a speed of somewhere around 30 miles an hour, then you can bet your life it's beginning to hurt. Well, this is uh, Taffy on the back wheel of um, Martin Denbacher, who really is such a strong rider, had a tragic Tour de France himself last year when he had to quit the Tour. At the, when he, on hearing of the death of his sister in an auto crash well this tour for him has been a far happier one he's been much much stronger too Armstrong though is the rider who's dictating the pace so Motorola a little bit of light on the team after these sad few days and Armstrong now tried to provide that for the team and I'm sure in the back of his mind as he makes these pedal revs as well is Fabio Casatelli Armstrong and Motorola riding so well right now and he's heading, I think, for his second stage win because, try as they might, they're not really getting on terms with him because they haven't organised that chase behind. Andrea Ferragato is back there, Bruno Kengialta, the man that waited for Evgeny Berzin in the Alps and seemingly he's so strong this year, but he hasn't featured and yet he's trying to get on terms. This is Taffy and there's Martin Denbacher. They're about to swing up towards the finish as well and they're hanging on at the moment to second and third, but the race behind is closing in on them and they're not closing in on Lance Armstrong. So the memories of a few days ago, well, it's over a week ago now, the road down to Ravel, where Armstrong was outwitted by the Ukrainian Sergei Uchikov. No such thing's going to happen to him this time. The breakaway reforming here, as the rider coming up at the back is Jean-Cyril Robin, the Frenchman who rides on the Festina team. Ferragati at the lead is also here. So too is Vyacheslav Yakimov, Sam is in the middle. He almost won into Bordeaux yesterday. And they've picked up Dembaka and Taffy, but no sign ahead of this rider. Lance Armstrong now is under the kite. One kilometre to go to the finish. The worst of the climb is over. He's afforded himself a glance over his shoulder, and he will see nobody at all. The last time check we got was round about at 25, 27 seconds. That's enough. He won't take that back in just one kilometre of riding. This is Felagato. A late attack by him trying to get up towards second place. That would be a good result for Ferragato. He'll be really annoyed, in fact, that Armstrong got away because, for my money, he seemed to be the man in the breakaway who was the best bet for the win. Armstrong has gone. Ferragato trying to hang on to a breakaway move here. And he looks he's almost tempting riders to come out and join him. But he's got a little gap on the climb there. That might be good enough for second place. Armstrong knows now he's got the victory. So Motorola now have a genuine stage win in this year's Tour de France after the ceremony in Tepo. And Lance Armstrong, the last few pedal revs up the hill, and it is only a little hill towards the line, and this will be a well-taken victory indeed. This was no present by the race. This was a well-taken win for Lance Armstrong. He worked it all out. He was in the breakaway. He waited for the right moment. He chose the most brilliant place to launch the attack. Even so, it was still a long way to go to the finish, but he went, and he had more than 15 miles to ride. Armstrong, one last check, and then he points to the sky, he, uh, he puts his finger up, number one, and Lance Armstrong now is not just winning for himself or the team, he's also winning for Fabio Casatelli. The man who's been the world champion, the million-dollar man who won the big triple in the United States a couple of years ago. He's won a stage in the Tour de France in the past. Now he takes stage win number two for him here at the finish of Limoges. Another rider in sight behind him. So this was a great move. Lance Armstrong, he won't do a lot for his overall, but he will move up a little bit in the classification. Ferrogato 
has managed to hang on and he comes in just 33 seconds behind. So he made a great climb and it proved the difference between second and finishing in the group. Vyatoslav Yekimov sprinting clear of Robout. There's no doubt about the winner today. That was Lance Armstrong and he's going to cherish that moment as he kisses the skies and points to it. He was the winner, quite rightly so. A well-taken victory for him. He's now with Paul Sherwin. Lance, at the finish line there, you looked, at, you looked up at the skies. What were you thinking about? Oh. Well, there's no question what's been on our mind for the uh, you know, the past three days. and I think it's been on everybody's mind. And, and not that we set out to win the bike race today. We, we only... Uh, uh, meant to be here and 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 and, uh, and try to recover it but certainly Fabio was motivating me today and I thought of him every second once you jumped away with 18 miles to go it was if you were a man possessed as if nobody was going to come back to you oh I was possessed <laughs> certainly and you thought a lot about him over the last few kilometers I mean it was it was super because all day the the people on the side of the road never let me forget, not, not that I was going to forget, but the people were very supportive and, and I did, there wasn't a minute that went by that I didn't hear poor Fabio. You know, you came to this Tour de France, you wanted two things before you went away. You wanted to finish to get to Paris and you wanted to take a stage of victory. You've almost succeeded in doing both. Well, we're almost finished, which is nice and uh, certainly I wanted to win the stage. I, I was close one day but uh, came up short and, and then we had the tragedy and, and I didn't think that uh, it was going to happen because I was, uh, I was too devastated, everybody was devastated and my mind was in another place, it just it all came together today. An understandably emotional Lance Armstrong after winning this stage of the Tour de France. The Motorola team, by the way, all agreed after the accident at Cassatelli to donate all of their prize money won in this year's Tour de France. The organization has also donated a large slice of prize money too. This is the overall classification today. Miguel Indurain has a very nice buffer ahead of Alex Zula of just over two and a half minutes. But the race for third place, well, it's close. Bjorn Arish is trying now for the best ever finish by a Danish rider, and Laurent Jalabert too would like a place on the podium in Paris. If we're looking for an outsider to win today in the time trial, why not Tony Rominger, who started this race overall as a pre-race favourite with Miguel Indurain, but since then he has disappointed. Rominger could ride well today, and a good ride by him could bring him up to sixth place overall in Paris tomorrow. So the final phase is about to begin. The pack will make its final shuffle. The time trial is called the race of truth. It's also called the race of pain. Indeed it is, 46 and a half kilometres of pain around Lac de Fassivier and this was the lake of course where Greg LeMond won his first stage of a Tour de France. This is Tony Rominger, despite a bike change for a flat tyre, he has been setting the best time at all of the points since the 22 kilometre marker. Now he's aiming at the time, surprisingly so, a great time trial done so far by Alvaro Mejia, the Colombian member of Team Motorola, but Rominger is going to beat this, and I wonder just what sort of time he would have done without that flat tyre. Rominger is still going to be well inside the hour, and he's going to be on top by two minutes and two seconds. Well, this is a man who is still looking for a top three finish on the podium in Paris. Laurent Jalabert makes his start. And the man he's trying to deprive of third place is Bjorn Arise. Remember his great time trial? It seems an awful long time ago now, a couple of weeks ago in Belgium, when he almost turned the tables on Miguel Indurain. And now at the checkpoint here, Rominger's the best time. Reese has gone through 16 seconds better. So Bjorn Arise is still firing in the time trial. And Laurent Jalabert, I don't think, will be able to live with the Big Dane on this sort of a course. There's very little flat on this road. It undulates an awful lot. It's in the most beautiful part of France outside Limoges. Alex Zula coming through here now to the checkpoint. He's only going to be third, but that's OK. He's behind at Rominger and Rees, but he is still holding on to that big time gain he's made out in the Alps. And so Indurain now will be the last man to arrive at the checkpoint. And Miguel Indurain is confirming his fifth Tour de France here. He is going to be quicker than Bjorn Rees, but not by much, because Indurain is going to go through 27 seconds quicker than Bjorn Rees, and that is the time check at 49 kilometres.
So Laurent Jalabert is doing all he has to do now to hang on to fourth place. He's not going to get near uh, Bjarne Ries at all. But even so, Jalabert has had a most amazing Tour de France. He's going to come home here with a time. Uh, he's going to beat Melchior Mary, the winner of the Tour of Spain a couple of years ago. Indeed, he comes up to the line. And Laurent Jalabert will be third fastest on the leaderboard for the moment at least. 59 minutes, 32 seconds. Let's go out now to Bjorn Arise, still to finish, riding, of course, ahead of Miguel Injurain on the road and in front of Alex Zula. He, in fact, is six minutes uh, ahead of Injurain out of the start house. This is the rider riding three minutes behind Bjorn Arise, Alex Zula. And what a daunting prospect it must be to have Injurain chasing you. Here comes Reese up towards the finishing line. The tie to beat is that of Tony Rominger. Remember, though, that Rominger had a flat tyre out on the course. And Reese though, is getting close and is going to be slightly quicker than Rominger. So this has been another great ride by Bjorn Aris. He's certainly finished third in Paris now. 58-22, top of the leaderboard. But there are still two men to finish. And this is one of them, and he's still staying ahead of Bjarne Ries out on the course, but only by a few seconds. These are not the big margins that Miguel Indurain has had in the past in the time trials. Alex Zula doing it just enough today to keep his second place overall. And I think we're about to get confirmation of that now. Ries is the leader. As Zula comes up, he won't match Ries's time. He will, in fact, finish with the fifth best time and a minute and one second slower than Ries. But that won't be enough for Ries to move up into second place. Zula will stay second overall. And so, as Alex Zula finishes his big effort, the man who is coming towards the closing stages now of his final effort in the time trial this year in the Tour de France, Miguel Indurain. And just look at the time on the clock. This time, Bjorn Aris is not going to get too close to him at all. It won't be far off being a minute the split around Lake Vesivier. Miguel Indurain has won his fifth Tour de France today, that's for sure. He only has tomorrow the lap of honour which will take him onto the Champs-Élysées. It's all in a day's work. So he just puts his bike to one side, goes straight to the podium and salutes the crowd. Miguel Indurain leads the time trial section of the Tour again, this time by only 48 seconds, a minute five better than Tony Rominger. And that fourth place finish by Ivan Gotti, another superb performance, assured him now of fifth place finish in Paris today. This is the 20th stage going from St. Genevieve on the outskirts into the city centre. 155 kilometres and nobody now can challenge Miguel Indurain or stop his fifth victory. These are the sights the survivors will see. And of course, one man who knows what it feels like better than most is the great Greg LeMond, a rider who's won the Tour de France three times. Gary Imlach spoke to him in the United United States. I uh, have a big race next summer, next winter, called the Birkebeiner. It's America's largest, biggest one-day race, and uh, I have two thousand dollars riding on it. I at least found a reason that wasn't in my head. I mean, for uh, for several years now, I just started thinking, man, maybe your body does go down that fast. But no, nowhere in the world, history of cycling has a guy with my talent gone down so fast. How hard was it for you to leave the race you really loved the way you did? Uh, it was embarrassing. I mean, it was painful. And I, I kept hoping that I'd turn around, but I knew after the third day there was something wrong. The team time trial, I knew something was wrong. Without my hunting accent, 87, 88, were, I was just beginning. I mean, right now, if you look at cyclists, they are only reaching their peak at 20, 29. I was 25 when I went on my first tour. My best years were, would have been 26, 27, 28, 
I'm leaving the sport unsatisfied, and I miss, and I've missed it for the last three years. I miss being in that great of shape, being in the front, being competitive, being there to counterattack. To, I mean, there's nothing better than being at your best in the Tour de France. And it's a game for three weeks that lasts. It's like a soap opera, and you get to be the main actor. That's fun. You can feel the enthusiasm of America's finest ever cyclist, Greg LeMond, still living the Tour de France with the riders as they now race across the Place de la Concorde towards the end of this long three-week occasion. And the riders are really putting on a show as well. Not surprisingly, there's been very few attacks all day until they came onto the Champs-Élysées. And then this little group has stolen nine seconds. It's a good breakaway group, and it's looking extremely positive at the moment. They could well stay away here all of the way to the line. And we've got one rider we've noted in here, Sergei Uchikov, the rider who beat Lance Armstrong, Ravel. And the Motorola rider is Alvaro Mechir. Marco Serpolini is from Lamprey, the former junior world champion, at the back of the tag here. But the field is closing in very, very quickly now. Arturus Casputis and Flavio Vanzella are the other two in the front group. Mechir sitting at the back now, and Uchikov is going for an early one. He's come out of the tunnel here now. He's going to race into the last two kilometres. But the whole field now, led by Gianluca Bortolami, the World Cup holder, who's trying to bring the Mape boys back into the thick of it. And look at the speed of the field now as they cross the gap here and into the finishing straight this time. The field are coming round extremely rapidly now. They'll straighten up and they'll see the finish. Mekir is leading out and Vanzella is looking over his shoulder, waiting as long as he can, but straight out of the pack now. Gino Lombardi is gone. This is a tremendous spin for the line. In fact, Uchikov crashed in the last kilometre off our cameras. He's out of it now. The sprinters have got it in the end. And Abdu Jaffro, I think, has got the victory in Paris. He's done it before. He's finally got his first victory of this year's Tour de France. And what a place to choose to do it. And so Abdu Japarov gets the victory and Miguel Indurain salutes the crowd as the final winner for the fifth year in succession of the Tour. This was the sprint where the sprinters appeared literally out of nowhere. And what a great one for Jamaluddin Abdu Japarov to win. You can always pick him out. Here's the one who always gave, gives us the most movement with his bike and he goes so far clear of the field today. Fagnini second and Giovanni Lombardi in the Palti colours snatching third place. Lauren Jalabert finishing fourth on the stage. Exactly the same finish he gets on the Tour de France overall. What a great ride for him as well. Well done, Abdu Japarov. He takes the last stage. He'll go home feeling a little bit vindicated after this. And so the result of the final stage of this year's tour, Abdu Japarov beating Fanini, Lombardi, Jalaber, Max Chiandri and Eric Zabel taking six this time out. Well, no green jersey for Jamaluddin this year, but he's won it before. He'll have to be content, though, with a stage win in Paris on this occasion. The final overall position of this year's tour, Miguel Indurain, the first man ever to win five tours in a straight line, a nap hand for him, beating Alex Zula in the end by four minutes and 35 seconds. They're the Indurain margins we've come to know over the years. And the fine ride, too, by the Danish rider Bjorn Rees. I'm Phil Liggett on behalf of World Cycling Productions saying, until the next time, goodbye.